Hi guys, and welcome to our next lecture on the intertidal zone. So this is our first in the series of ecosystems. So we're gonna start basically with the closest ecosystem to land, and then we're gonna work our way all the way out to the very, very deep sea, which will be our last lecture. So let's go ahead and get started with the intertidal zone. Now, the intertidal zone, again, the name says intertidal zone. So in between the tides, meaning the area from the highest high tide to the lowest low tide. Even up in the highest high tide, the very splash zone is the upper, upper intertidal zone. So anywhere that even gets splashed with seawater is still considered the intertidal zone. Sometimes those areas only get splashed when it is really, really rough out. Like say you have a big winter storm and it's a high tide and there's big 10 foot waves crashing up on the store that, li that literally the top area where the last droplet actually hits is still considered the intertidal zone because there are some organisms that live way up in that splash zone that really only get, ever get covered with water during those big heavy winter storms. So that again, lowest low tide to the absolute highest high tide including the splash zone would be the intertidal zone and that's what we're focusing on today. Now what we're going to start talking about um, the next lecture is known as the subtidal zone. The subtidal zone again is anywhere below the intertidal zone. So subtidal never gets exposed to air, right? Never gets exposed to the actual land conditions because it is subtidal, below the lowest low tide. So anything that is subtidal is constantly submerged. Anything intertidal, it depends whether you're going to be submerged, whether it's high tide or low tide. So at low tide, perhaps you're going to be exposed, but at high tide, you're going to be covered. Intertidal zone. All right, so here's exactly where we are. As you can see right here, this is my land mass right here. This is the open ocean or the pelagic zone. This is the area of the continental shelf. This is the continental slope. And then again, you're gonna have your abyssal plain way out here. But we're talking about the intertidal zone. So we're talking about just this little line area right in here. That would be the intertidal zone. Again, the only the area between the lowest low tide and the highest high tide. So it's going to, only, it's going to vary depending on your tide. So if in the summer months, or if there's a full moon, maybe you have bigger tides, higher highs and lower lows. Um, in the winter, or during what's called neap tides, maybe you have smaller tides, so the intertidal zone is a little bit smaller. But again, the intertidal zone is typically characterized between the lowest low tide and the highest high tide, no matter what the actual tide is, whether it's high tide or low tide. That area that sometimes gets exposed or is almost always exposed is still considered the intertidal zone. Now, the substrate, remember substrate just means bottom, so there are lots of different types of intertidal substrates. We could go to a sandy beach, that intertidal zone, the substrate would all be just sand. Right? Sometimes you have finer sand, sometimes you have coarser sand, sometimes you have bigger grains, sometimes you have smaller grains, that's more like mud or silt. Right? That's all the substrate that you have. So typically when we're talking about the intertidal zone, you're either talking about the sandy beach right, intertidal zone or what's called the rocky intertidal zone. And the rocky intertidal zone is going to allow for a lot more species to live there because of the complexity. Remember, if you just have a flat surface, you can only live here, 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 or maybe sometimes inside the uh, in funnel, right, inside the sediment. But if you actually have a rocky reef, you have all of this 3D area. So now you can live here, 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 here. You're increasing the surface area, which increases what's called niches, or little spaces where organisms can live. Remember rugosity, that word rugosity, rugosity means complexity, right? Very low rugosity if you're gonna have just a sandy beach because it's just a flat bottom. Very high rugosity if you're gonna have say a rocky reef because now you have all of these different areas, the surface area to increase the amount of niches available. So we either have soft sandy beaches, right? With the sand or the silt or the mud or we're gonna have rocky intertidal zone which actually has those rocks, sometimes pebbles, sometimes boulders, sometimes big you know, cliffs of rocks, depending on where you are. Now, there's a couple different classifications, whether you're going to live on, above, or below the, uh, the sediment. If you're going to live above it, right, on top of it, that is epifaunal. Remember, epi means on top. So epifaunal means you live on top of the bottom. Say if you're on a rock, you're gonna live right here on a rock. Right? Say if you're on the sand, you're going to live right here on the sand. So you can think of things like um, flatfish, sea stars, um, anything that's going to be crawling on the bottom, little snails, that's going to be epifaunal. On rocky reefs, you're going to have barnacles, limpets, anemones, those are all epifaunal. They're living on top. Now if you are in faunal, in faunal, that means you're inside the sediment. If you're in a sandy beach, maybe you're a clam down here. 
your little burrowing crab or shrimp. If you are in the rocky intertidal, probably not a lot of infaunal organisms there because you would actually have to burrow down into the rock itself. Um, but we do have some organisms that do that. Two worms kind of lay the, and secrete their little calcium carbonate um, shell on the rocks, but they're still considered epifaunal, not really infaunal. So really the only infaunal organisms that we're going to have in the intertidal zone are going to be inside the sandy beach area. Things like your little um, uh, sand crabs and stuff like that that dig and bury down into the deep. Uh, myofauna. Myofauna is basically these tiny little organisms that live in between the sand grains. If you are my myofaunal, you are small. You are really, really, really tiny. Because essentially what you're doing is you're living in between the sand grains and sometimes even holding on to the sand. Like they're actually grabbing onto the sand. So this really is going to determine, uh, be determined by how big the sand grains are. If they're very, very small, there's not a lot of distance in between each sand grain. So you're going to be more packed tightly. You're not going to get things like oxygen, right? It's not going to be able to fit through it. So when you have like silt or mud, it's sometimes known as anoxic or lacking oxygen. So you don't have a lot of myofauna in there because they don't have anything to breathe. If you have larger, like coarse grains of sand, then yes, you're actually going to have a lot more myofauna because they're going to be able to fit in between the spaces of the sand grains. And we're going to see that in just a little bit. Now, when you're living in the intertidal zone, you're facing a lot of difficulties. And we're going to go through each of these one by one. But you have to deal with things like constantly changing environment, right? So say you're living in the intertidal zone and you're in the middle intertidal zone. Half the time you're exposed to the air and half the time you're covered in water. Well, sometimes you have really great temperature fluctuations, like it's 100 degrees outside and the water is only 60. You're going to go through a 40 degree difference in a matter of an hour, uh, you know, depending on the tide. That's a really big difference. Right? Physiologically, that's really hard to deal with, so these organisms have to deal with that. Desiccation is a big one. Desiccation means drying out or water loss. If you are in the upper intertidal zone, you're almost never exposed to the water, which means you have to be able to prevent, you're still a marine organism, you still breathe the oxygen via water, right? via your gills. So you can't even breathe when you, you know, you're out of this water. So that is interrupted feeding, interrupted oxygen availability, um, all sorts of stuff. So let's go ahead and just start talking about these right now. All right, so the first one, desiccation, water loss, right? Drying up, really a bad thing for marine organisms. I mean, a bad thing for us too, but really bad things for marine organisms. So if you are in the upper middle intertidal zone, right, you have to worry about constantly being exposed to the air, so you do not want to dry up. One of the ways that you can actually avoid this um, is by hiding. So if you simply, if you're say a sea star, or something that can move, what you want to do is you want to physically move and you want to crawl around to somewhere that's actually going to be covered in water. If you are a sea star, you're going to move down with the tide to the lower inner tidal zone. If you are a hermit crab, perhaps you're going to crawl into one of those little pools that are nearby, right? Um, same thing with fishes, like they have to, the fishes especially have to stay in water, so you will physically go to an area that you know will not dry up. So that's hiding or moving. Um, and that's only if you're able to move. So if you're not able to move, then you're not really able to hide. Sometimes organisms can do what's called clamming up. And essentially, you're closing yourself up into your little house. If you're a barnacle, you basically shut your little doors into your little volcano castle. If you are an anemone, you tuck in your tentacles. Instead of having them open and you're being exposed, you tuck in your fleshy part and kind of clam up. Same thing with uh, snails. Snails have operculums, like gill operculums for fishes. They have operculums and that's what they do. They shut kind of like their front door and they protect whatever water is in there with them. They protect, and it is airtight, right? They close their little door up, they hide inside, and they basically are breathing whatever water that they have. They're living off whatever water that they have inside their little shell. So clamming up is really effective. I mean, periwinkle snails, which live only in the splash zone in the upper inner tidal zone, maybe get covered in water two or three times a year, depending on how many storms there are. Um, so you really do a really good job of protecting whatever water is in there. And again, you want to slow your metabolism and stuff like that, but all things we're going to talk about. Um, these are going to be chitons or limpets. That's right. They are chitons, right? You can tell because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plates along their back. So what these guys have done, and it's kind of hard to see, but these guys have actually found a little pool to crawl into. 
So this little pool will just have a tiny bit of water, but it's enough for them to survive. So these guys in this case have moved and crawled into where they know a pool is going to be to protect themselves. Well, to keep themselves from drying up. Um, so again, this clamming up basically helps them close inside their house, keep whatever water is there and kind of protect themselves. Um, do, 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 do. So again, the snail has no perculum. The oyster or the clams can just close up their shell. Same thing when it comes to barnacles. Um, basically what we're doing is we're trying to protect whatever water is there. Okay, so we're protecting whatever water is inside of us so that we can stay moist. Remember, we do not want to dry up, right? If our organs dry up, if our cells dry up, we're going to die. So this prevents all the water, keeps all the water inside of us so that we can actually survive until the next high tide. Uh, here's the operculum of a shell. So this is a very typical little clam shell right here. Sorry, clam shell, snail shell right here. And what you see is actually if you were to tap on this, it would be hard, almost hard like plastic. This is a, kind of like the shell material, not quite as strong, but strong enough to essentially close their front door and protect whatever water is on the inside of them so that they don't dry up and they don't die. Next up is temperature changes. So again, we've gone through that 40 degree temperature change. We were in the cold, cold water that's 60 degrees. Now we're in the hot summer sun and it's 100 degrees. So we've gone through a 40 degree temperature difference in a matter of minutes, really. And that is super, super physiologically hard for you. So some organisms actually, if they're exposed to that hot, hot summer heat, have mechanisms to keep themselves cool, right? To cool themselves off. That's another reason you kind of want to trap yourself with the water. That water is a really, really good heat conductor. Sorry, heat absorber. So as that water heats up, right, you don't. The water is absorbing all that extra heat and temperature and stuff, and you don't. So another reason you want to keep not, uh, a lot of water inside of you. Um, so again, we're ranging up to a 40 degree temperature difference in a matter of hours, and that can be really physically hard on you. Uh, changing salinity. So say we are in the intertidal zone and it is, you know, 3.5 parts per thousand, right? And so it's nice and salty, but now it's low tide and I'm exposed to the air, but it's raining. What are you going to do? You've now gone from 3.5 parts per thousand to zero parts per thousand. That is a big difference in salinity. So now you've gone from a lot of salt to no salt, too much fresh water. And again, we talked about osmoregulation, keeping your cells nice and happy, right? That's really hard to do if all of a sudden you go to salt water, fresh water, salt water, fresh water. Just like you can't take your goldfish and throw it in the ocean, you can't take a marine fish and throw it in, you know, your tank at home. It's because of the salt concentration differences. So these guys have to constantly go through differences in salinities. Say you're one of these little organisms that actually crawl into a pool. Well, you're going to crawl into a pool now that water is beginning to evaporate as it heats up. So now what went from 35 parts per thousand now is increasing in salinity because you're decreasing in the water. So now the water is going down, but the salt is remaining the same. Now it's getting saltier and saltier and saltier. So not only do you have potentially fresh water to deal with if it's raining, but you have lots of salt water to deal with if you're in a pool and say it's evaporating. So big, big differences in salinity, and some of them can be very, very difficult to, um, to survive. Um, Sorry, 35 parts per thousand, 3.5%, 35 parts per thousand. That's what we're talking about here. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about estuaries coming up in uh, the next two lectures. Um, and again, estuaries are where fresh water meets the ocean. So if you are a intertidal organism living near an estuary, you're not only having to worry about what happens if it rains, you're constantly getting this fresh water influx. Say there's a big storm in the mountains or it's the springtime and all the snow is melting. Now you're getting that constant flux uh, fresh water every single day coming in. So even in, uh, in the intertidal zone near an estuary, you have to deal with these intense salinity changes, going from very, very fresh water to very, very salty water. So a lot to deal with. Interrupted feeding. So let's say we're going to talk about that periwinkle snail who maybe only gets covered two or three times a season, right? You can only eat two or three times a season. If you're eating, say you're doing, uh, say you're a barnacle, right? And you're, you're feeding with your little siri. You have to have water surrounding you to do that. If you're in the upper inner tidal zone, you're only gonna get water maybe once or twice a day. So you have to wait all day long, all day long for that tide to come in for a chance to feed. 
right? So again, you would probably have to slow your metabolism way down, and that's not really something that you can control, but luckily these guys have these adaptations over the years that have allowed them to do this, and therefore, that's why they're only, some of the only uh, organisms that can actually live in the upper intertidal zone is because they can do this clamming up, they can wait to feed, they can wait to breathe, right? They have to slow their metabolisms down, but they can actually survive that way. Uh, which is great for them because they have very little competition in that area because it's such a harsh environment, such a harsh um, place to live. Now, we talked about semi-diurnal tides. Remember, that means at least two high tides and two to low tides during a day. They can be mixed semi-diurnal, can be the same. Um, so again, some organisms basically only get half of the day for a chance to feed, for a chance to breathe, right, to do that respiration. Not a lot, so you really have to be able to um, survive in these really, really nasty conditions. So if anyone has ever been to the intertidal zone, you've probably had to deal with some kind of waves, right? I hate waves because I'm a scuba diver and diving in these waves is really a pain in the butt, right? You're constantly just being knocked over. Or like the surfers that can just go dolphin dive right underneath. I cannot. Just like these organisms who live in the intertidal zone cannot, right? They basically have to deal with the bashing and the bashing and the bashing of these waves just hitting them, hitting them, hitting them all day, every day, right? The waves don't stop just because you're tired. So if it's a really stormy season, if it's the winter time, if it's, you know, um, some tsunamis offshore, you're getting hit with the really, really strong forces every single day. In fact, depending on how many waves are coming in, every single minute of every single day, you're just being bashed by these. So it's really, really important if you're living in these high wave areas to be strong and to be resistant against these waves. So, if you don't want to be dislodged from your rock, you need to hold on. So those limpets, those chitons, those snails, they're basically holding on for dear life. They're, they're able to move around, but the whole time they're like, oh, I need to hold on, I need to move a little, hold on. If you're a barnacle, you're cement kind of attached to the bottom. So you better hope that you cemented to a good place so that you're not going to get knocked off by those waves. So, again, space becomes now kind of an issue because you need to hold on to that rock. If you can't hold on to that rock, you're going to get knocked off. You're going to die. So it's really, really important to be able to um, withstand the forces that are constantly being smashed upon you via these waves. So a couple organisms can do this in different ways. One, if you're, say, an algae, you have a really strong holdfast, right? You need to grab onto something and you need to hold on to it something. If you've ever been to the beach, you've probably seen drift algae. Right? That's probably algae that has been dislodged. Right? It didn't just die and start floating away. It was dislodged from its holding. So it obviously didn't pick a good enough rock, a strong enough rock. Sometimes when you're little, you pick a good rock, but now you're really, really big, and the forces of the waves coming blows you off that little, little rock, or takes the whole rock with you sometimes. And you can see it still attached to the rock rolling around. Not good for the algae. So you can see this in calm water. They're just kind of relaxed, nice, and here the blades are out. But in very, very high currents, right, you almost kind of want to be um, streamlined so that the water will blow over you without ripping you off. If you're too thick or too heavy here, it could actually pull you right off the stock. So having this kind of streamlined body, or at least this flexible body, will allow you to kind of withstand some of that um, wave action. Now, if you're an anemone, right, like this little guy, say nice calm waters, he is doing a suspension feeding, so he's out there trying to grab stuff, pull it towards his mouth, grab stuff, pull it towards his mouth, okay? If he is like this, he's okay if it's in calm water, but during rough waters, his tentacles could rip off, his whole stalk could become dislodged, and then he's for sure going to die. So what he does is behaviorally, he shrinks down and kind of tucks his little, anten or his little um, um, tentacles in. So again, shrink down, you allow that water to go up and over you while still being able to feed and protecting your um, tentacles. Now, we talked a little bit about um, having to wait to feed. Well, you also have to wait to breathe, right? If you're that periwinkle snail and you're living way up on the shore, you have gills, you cannot breathe air, right? You have to suck that oxygen out of the water. So you have intermittent feeding, depending on the tides, you also have intermittent breathing. Right, which is kind of a big deal. Because as you're going through, say, you know, if you're still doing fermentation, so say with the lack of oxygen, your um, cells are still gonna go through fermentation and glycolysis, you produce CO2. Well, CO2 is toxic, right? That's why when you inhale oxygen, you exhale that CO2. Well, if you build up too much CO2 and you can actually create a lot of problems. 
So you can actually create these like toxic byproducts of your metabolism that you have no way to get rid of. So you're trying to breathe, you're trying to get rid of all your aft gases, your bad gases, and so you, you have to kind of wait to do all of that. So this can be really kind of problematic when you build up too much CO2. So any organisms that are gonna live in the upper intertidal zone can basically withstand that, and they don't actually have to, well, they have ways of dealing with this uh, excess CO2. Unlike us, where we don't have to deal with excess CO2 because I take a breath, and as soon as I exhale, I'm releasing my CO2 outwards. But these guys can't do that. They have to wait for the water to actually come back up to the shore before they can do that. So it kind of becomes problematic, again. Really harsh conditions living in this intertidal zone. We talked about the barnacle and the uh, anemone and the chitons all finding a good spot, right? This is my rock. I'm attached to this rock now permanently forever. You better have picked a good rock because space is very limiting in this intertidal zone. If you're already here, a barnacle can't settle there. You're already there, right? If there's a piece of algae living there and I'm a chiton, I can't attach to a rock because the algae's there. I can't be there. So space becomes very, very limiting. If you've ever been to the intertidal zone, you can see there's just a ton of muscles packed in together, a ton of barnacles packed in together. The rocks almost look like they have acne. They have so many little barnacles popping, poking out, right? That's because everyone's fighting for space. And so as soon as someone settles there, nobody else can settle there. That space is now gone. So space is a limiting factor. So nobody can survive if that guy's already there. Nobody else can grow there, which is a lot of the times why you'll see barnacles living on mussels. That was the only space available, so I took it, right? Sometimes it works out for them, sometimes it does not. Okay, so space can be very, very limiting, especially good space. Um, chitons, you'll see a lot of times they crawl into little cracks and crevices. That's because it protects them from the sunlight, but it also kept, you know, usually traps a little bit of water. But if you look at all the cracks and crevices, they're almost all taken by chitons, by limpets, by someone who's crawled in there and basically now surviving in there. So premier space can be very limiting on these spots. So you want to get there and you want to get there quickly. This becomes an issue later because some organisms can outcompete. Some algae can outgrow other algae because they grow faster and therefore now that uh, faster growing algae will shade the other algae. That other algae cannot do photosynthesis now that other lower algae is going to die out. So competition for space is very, very intense in this intertidal zone. Not just between organisms but between algae as well. Now. Because there's so much competition, and because organisms can really only live in certain intertidal areas, right? If you're going to have your things like the, uh, your algae and your fishes, things that need to constantly be wet, they're going to be in the lower intertidal zone. Organisms that can survive higher up are going to pretty much only be found higher up because there's no competition up there. So things like barnacles and those periwinkle snails, they're all going to live higher up because down below there's way too much competition, and they would be outcompeted. But unlike the organisms that have to stay down below, they can survive up here. So they will survive up there um, and choose to live there because, you know, competition down below is much, much higher than it is up above. A lot of organisms can live in the ocean. Not a lot of organisms can survive up exposed to the air for so long. So that's kind of why zonation happens or certain zones, you'll find certain organisms in certain zones up in the intertidal zone. So let's talk about the Pacific Ocean because that's where we are right now. So we are in the Pacific Ocean right here. This is the upper intertidal zone way up here. We have things like periwinkle snails, limpets, some lichens, um, way, way, way up here because not a lot of organisms can live up here. As we move farther down, now we have a majority of barnacles, things like acorn barnacles, which are very, very common on off our coast. You'll get some uh, algae, like some of the green algae can survive pretty high up. And that's because green algae, again, are the ancestor of land plants, so they're kind of a little bit more resistant to living half in the ocean and half on land. As you move to the lower middle intertidal zone, you'll have things like, you'll still have your barnacles, but now you're going to get mostly things like mussels. You're going to get mussels, you're going to get barnacles, you're going to get some, a lot more seaweeds right here, seagrasses, seagrasses, algae, stuff like that. Moving to the lower intertidal zone, again, this one is mostly covered all the time. Okay, so this is going to be post permite. Primarily your seagrasses, your algae, fishes, um, nudibranchs, stuff like that, like those sea hairs that we saw, are going to probably be in between the middle and the lower intertidal zone. If you go too far down, then you're actually in the ocean ocean, right? And this is where you're going to get a lot of predators, because predators can survive the ocean, but you've got to be really, really adept to survive the intertidal zone. 
So too far down, you're going to get a lot more predators. Too far up, you're going to have really harsh conditions. Good luck surviving. Um, so again, you're going to have the greatest diversity probably here in the middle intertidal zone. Um, and then you're going to have mostly just straight up marine organisms when you get to the lower intertidal. Slightly different if you were to look at the Atlantic Ocean. Right here, they do not have periwinkle barnacles, sorry, periwinkle snails. Um, they do have lichens, some encrusting algae, way, way up here in the upper annual tidal zone. Notice how it looks a little bit different. We have pretty much primarily barnacles in that upper middle intertidal zone. And then you're going to get things like mussels and rockweeds uh, in the lower middle intertidal zone. And just pretty much um, Irish mosses and your other algaes are going to be in your lower intertidal zone. So slightly different community composition. Um, but if you go to almost any intertidal zone in the Pacific, it's going to look like this. Maybe varying just slightly depending on where you are. And if you go to almost any intertidal zone in the Atlantic, it's going to look like this. Depending, again, depending on where you are. Um, so these are like clear snapshots of these environments. These are like little ecosystems that we can very consistently predict the community composition of. The upper, you're going to have periwinkles and barnacles. The middle, you're going to have barnacles and mussels. The lower, you're going to have algaes and things like sea stars and nudibranchs and stuff like that. Very, very predictable communities. So they're stable communities because they are very diverse. They kind of, every one species kind of keeps the other in check for the most part. Now, we talked about competition being very, very high, right? Competition for space, competition for food, competition for mates. Competition is very, very high in the intertidal zone. Um, it's always going to be higher in things like um, the lower intertidal zone are going to be less severe again because more organisms can live there. So when you are in the lower intertidal zone, right, you're going to have constant water, you're going to have constant, rarely constant salinity, constant temperature, stuff like that. But in the upper intertidal zone, especially the middle intertidal zone, you're going to get these great fluctuations. So competition is always going to be um, a little bit higher when you're talking about the upper intertidal zones. Sorry, sorry, other way around. I'm saying this backwards. Competition, because less organisms can live in the upper intertidal zone, competition is less because there's more space, right? Less organisms can survive there. The lower intertidal zone, you're gonna have more competition because everybody can live there, right? It has the constant temperature, it has the constant salinity, it has the constant all that, right? Which is why it's going to be, again, much more livable. So you're gonna have more competition there because it's much more organisms can survive there versus the upper intertidal zone where few organisms can survive. So you're really not going to have a lot of competition between those pairing and snails. They have a lot, a lot of space. So again, competition higher in the lower intertidal zone because there's more spaces that more organisms can live in. In the upper intertidal zone, less organisms can survive there, therefore less competition. There it is. Um, what else? Ah, like I said, some organisms will outcompete other organisms. This algae grows faster than this algae, which means it's going to grow nice and tall and shade this algae, which means this algae can't do photosynthesis and this algae is going to die. This algae has now outcompeted that. Um, some organisms are really, really good at outcompeting. So, say like mussels, as soon as the mussels move in, there's pretty much nothing that outcompetes a mussel. So, if the mussels are allowed to take over, they're going to take over. You're going to lose things like the barnacles and the limpets and the chitons and the algae. Essentially, you're just going to have mussels, which we are going to see in just a second. Because when we lose our keystone predator that eats the mussels, right, our community, entire community composition is going to shift, just like we saw in the kelp forest. Um, now, when we actually have some new land that comes up, so say new area that has now been exposed, so say we had a big winter storm and it came in and it knocked off this big patch of rock. Every organism that was there is now gone. We now have brand new land for organisms to settle on. Well, what happens is usually it's a very predictable pattern. The fastest growing organism is going to settle there first, right? He was there, he was able to settle and grow and establish himself. Well, usually the fastest growing organism isn't always the organism that outcompetes the other organisms. You can be more resilient and therefore eventually in the long term, it goes from this community to this community. That is known as succession. One organism moves in, then another, then another, then another. It basically transforms the community from this to this to this to this. And this is something that happens in every ecosystem. If you were to have a wildfire like we did here in the Santa Monica Mountains, right? We have a wildfire that kills off basically everything there. The first thing that's going to come back are your grasses. Now, your grasses grow really, really quick. 
but it doesn't mean they're going to outcompete all those bushes and trees later on. It just means they're the first ones to establish themselves. Then eventually the bushes and shrubs would start to grow, final, followed by eventually the trees and stuff. So eventually you're going to get back to that big beautiful forest that you had, but the first one that's going to be there are your grasses, then your shrubs, then your trees, then your forest, right? That is the succession. It goes from one to da, to da, to da. Okay, so that is basically um, uh, the change in the community after a either disturbance or say a new land is formed, like volcanoes, you know, create new land all the time. All the time. You know, they create new land and organisms will eventually live there, but there is a succession. Um, when it comes to volcanoes, the lichens come first. The lichens are basically kind of like an algae, almost like an algae and a fungus, right? Slightly different, but um, they kind of work together. It's like mutualistic organism. They're the first, what's known as a pioneer species, because when there's no um, nutrients in the soil, say like volca volcanic rock, right? It was just, it was magma. It was liquid lava, right? There's no nutrients in there. The lichens, what they do is they actually start fixing um, some nitrogen, fixing some phosphorus, fixing all of these um, nutrients that we need and then placing them into the soil. So eventually things like grasses can absorb those nutrients and then grow. Grasses die, they produce their nutrients back into the soil, then the shrubs can grow. The shrubs die, they produce their nutrients out of the soil, etc. cetera, now the trees can grow. So that's kind of how that succession goes when it comes to um, establishing first-time communities or pioneer species like the lichens. Now the end result, so you've moved from the shrubs, the, the, the grasses to the shrubs, to the trees, to the forest, the end result would be the forest. So if left alone, this area would always become a forest. That's how it works in the intertidal zone. When left alone, we're always going to get this community. Okay, this is the climax community. This is a well-balanced community, which will always, and we've done experiments on this. We've cleared off huge sheets of this, and we watched who comes back first, who comes back second, and then eventually, it always turns out like this. So this is known as our climax community, or the end result. What happens after all this competition, and then the, uh, the community kind of settles down? Now, there is debate about this. What is a, commu a climax community? How do you know when it's done? How do you know when it's settled? We know that different years, some organisms do better, right? There are organisms that do better in, say, El Nino years, where there's lots and lots of water. Some uh, organisms do better when they're drought years, right? So the community still, based on the environment, is always shifting. So this climax community, it's just kind of a, an end result without really being the end. Right, because the climax community can still kind of vary a little bit, can shift a little bit. Sometimes we have El Nino years and our kelp forests do really bad, right? Because the waters are really, really warm and the kelp doesn't like it warm. Okay, so then the kelp dies off, right? So then you actually have like a lot of urchins, right? Well, probably not because all the kelp's gone. So then you don't have a lot of urchins. Then the kelp comes back and then the urchins come back. And then now there's too many urchins and not enough kelp. But then the urchins die. Then the kelp comes back. So you have this kind of like fluctuation. So again, this climax community is never like an actual, like it's done, done. It's kind of like, a, well, this is where the community is going to get to where we are in evolutionary time right now. Because right? so obviously our climax community, when the dinosaurs were around, were different. So this is kind of like a snapshot of what would happen to the community if everything stopped right now. So again, that's why I say right now, because it could change, again, depending on environmental conditions, the planet conditions, all sorts of stuff. So let's go back to these keystone species that we talked about. Remember the otters who eat the sea urchins, who eat the algae, right? You remove the otters, now your sea urchin population goes crazy, now the algae drops, and the ecosystem essentially is lost. Same kind of thing here, but in this case, our keystone predators are our sea stars. So sea stars eat mussels. When you have sea stars in your um, intertidal zone, you have a very balanced community. You have barnacles, and you have algaes, and you have mussels, and you have sea stars, and you have anemones, and you have all sorts of different organisms. This is a healthy environment. You want the maximum number of species. You always want the highest number of species, right? That's a very balanced ecosystem. What happens when we remove said sea stars, right? Now, the sea stars aren't going to be eating the mussels. Well, what happens is the mussels outcompete everybody. Like I said, the mussels are kind of resilient. Once they're there, they get established. So now the mussels outcompete the gooseneck barnacles and the acorn barnacles and the rockweeds. Now they're all gone, and we just have mussels. Now there's nobody there to eat the, the mussels, and the mussel population just booms out of control, 
And then that's it. And now all of our community composition, which was a nice, healthy, balanced ecosystem, is now just mussels. And unfortunately, because of the sea star wasting disease that we've had for the last like 10 years, this is kind of how a lot of our intertidal zones have, have shifted. Now, what happens if the sea star population comes back? Well, potentially, they have a ton of food. They can eat a lot of these mussels, which would create space, which would bring back all of our gooseneck barnacles and our acorn barnacles and our rockweeds and stuff like that. So, again, this is that fluctuation. Sometimes the predators are down and the prey goes up. Sometimes the prey goes up and the predators go down, vice versa. So it's a kind of a fluctuation. But this is the community that we should have when we lose our sea stars. This is the community that we have. Okay, so let's talk about some substrates really quick. We're going to get back to some of those myofauna and the grain size and stuff like that. So when we're talking about grain size, again, it really makes a difference the size of your grains. If you're going to be talking about big, chunky sand grains, like coarse sand grains, then it can be rolling around. And again, you're going to have a lot of space and air in between right, those grains. If you're talking about really, really fine grains of sand, they're going to be way pushed together so you're going to get way less oxygen and that's going to be that anoxic that I was talking about. Um, and again, um, not a lot of organisms can live there and in fact if you've ever been to an anoxic area, it kind of smells like rotting eggs. It's really gross. You can have things like weird archaeans and weird bacteria that live there but you're not going to have a lot of like normal organisms that live there because of the lack of oxygen because everything's so pushed together um, and that really soft, silty kind of sandy mud. So we look at grain size right here, again this would be like gravel and sand, really big grains, lots of space in between for the myofauna, lots of oxygen and water in between for the myofauna so you're not going to be anoxic. But as you get over here, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, again these grains can be pushed really close together and therefore you're not going to be able to get the, um, the same amount of oxygen in there so you're not going to get that nice oxygen flow and organisms that need oxygen, you're going to get like those anoxic archaeans and the bacteria and the really, really gross, foul producing stuff that are going to be living in that kind of sediment. Uh, now, if you are living in that anoxic area, again, really, well, you're probably only going to be still living in that first couple inches because once you get lower and lower and lower down, because in the top you're still going to have some turnover, you're still going to have some stuff rolling around, you're still going to get a little bit of that oxygen in the first couple inches to maybe a foot, but if you have really small grains of sand like that silt or that mud, as soon as you go down a couple inches to a foot, anything below that is going to be that anoxic. It's going to be really, really gross. Sometimes very productive, because you're going to get a lot of decay stuff in there, you're going to get a lot of breakdown, I mean a lot of nutrients that are going to be trapped in there, but not a lot of organisms are actually going to be able to survive there. Um, so if you are one of those bacteria that I talked about, you are known as an anaerobic bacteria. You don't need oxygen. You don't need oxygen. You don't like oxygen. Therefore, you can live in those areas. And usually a lot of these guys are producing that kind of like methane stink, like they're really that like rotten egg gross, um, because they are anoxic. They don't need oxygen, and therefore they're going through a whole different metabolic process than us and not producing, um, and not absorbing that oxygen and releasing CO2 like we do. Ah, if you are living in an infaunal air, sorry, if you are in faunal, meaning living in the sediment, and you are living in one of those areas where it's really soft and sandy, silty, like estuaries, you have to actually be able to breathe. So you can survive if you have some way of breathing. So a lot of these organisms will actually create little tubes and stuff for themselves. So tubes, tunnels, anything that's going to bring that fresh water with that oxygen down into your, um, into your little hole, your little burrow, then you can actually survive. So this is a really great way to live if you're, say, a clam, right, or maybe one of those little ghost shrimp that don't have a lot to protect you, but you live in that anoxic area because you can dig and you can burrow all the way down. So you have the protection of living inside the sediment, but you can either pop out to feed or you can pop out to breathe, or you literally just have some kind of circulation coming down into your tube. So as long as you are allowing oxygen to get all the way down there by, say, maybe burrowing yourself a little hole, then you can actually survive where no other organism can. So that will afford you a lot of protection. And that's what we can see right here. So we have things like isopods and bristle mouth worms, um, lung worms, these little coquina shells, some clams, right? So these guys are going to be able to burrow into the sediment, but they have an in-current siphon and an ex-current siphon. So they pull in fresh water 
circulate out what they need, including food, oxygen, etc., and then they're going to expel the rest of that water out. If you're going to be one of these little lungworms, right, you have burrowed a little tube for yourself. So even though you're living maybe in that anoxic area, right, you have two openings that you can actually do respiration through. Um, yeah, some of the epifaunal organisms you can see, like the crabs, you're going to have things like snails, sand dollars, these little sea cucumbers, blue crabs, anything like that, right? These are going to be considered your epifaunal organisms. Now, food webs. Food webs are always important, especially in each of these ecosystems. Who's getting the food and where is it coming from? So because we are in the intertidal zone, we're going to be able to do photosynthesis. So remember, this is the base of the food chain. The base of that food web is always going to be coming from the sun. We can't absorb sun energy ourselves, but we can eat algae, right, or plants that do. So the sun absorbs energy into the plants, right? The plants take that energy and they turn it into sugars. We eat them and get the sugars from them, or we eat the thing that eats them. Okay, so that's the food web. We've already done a little bit about food webs in class. Um, so this is just kind of hopefully going to be a refresher for you guys. So then we're starting off always at the bottom with our primary producers, right? So we have things like diatoms, which are doing photosynthesis. We have plankton. We have algae, right? They're going to be feeding things like the suspension feeders and the deposit feeders. So remember, deposit feeders, they're eating the sediment and taking out the nutrients and releasing the sediment, like our sea cucumbers and stuff. We're going to have suspension feeders like little crabs and barnacles. They're going to reach out, grab stuff, pull it in, reach out, grab stuff, pull it in. Finally, we're going to have our carnivores like your fishes, your birds, um, moon snails. Remember the holes inside those little shells that you guys find at the beach? Those were drilled by moon snails. So they're sitting there and they're drilling into you and then they inject this little digestive enzyme and drink you out of your shell. So these are going to be the carnivores. Once the carnivores die, right, they're going to feed, well basically when any of these guys die, they're going to turn into detritus. Remember poop and dead bodies, right? Well, there's a lot of organisms that, that survive just on these guys. So this is, our, um, this is our food web here for the sandy intertidal zone. Now, if we're looking at the rocky intertidal food web, remember, there's a lot more organisms that can live in that area. So therefore, you're going to have a bigger food web, a more diverse community. The more different food sources you have or who's eating who, right, the more stable your populations are going to be. If you only have one food source, what happens to that one food source? Well, what happens to you if that one food source disappears? Yeah, you basically, you die. Okay, so very important to actually have many different food sources and many different predators and prey to keep a nice balanced ecosystem. This is why we say things like we always need top predators, right? Like sharks, like killer whales, like anything like that, sea, star, uh, yeah, sea stars, sea otters. Those are all top predators because they keep the rest of the ecosystem kind of balanced and in check. Otherwise, like the mussels, everything kind of would just turn into a seed bed of mussels. So here's our rocky intertidal zone. We have things like seaweeds and diatoms and seagrasses and all the different species of algae that we have. We have our grazers, which are going to be feeding on our algae. Remember the, the limpets and the chitons and stuff? They're essentially going around licking rocks with their radulas, their very hard tongues. They're going to be scraping microalgae off of those rocks. Those are the grazers. We're going to have our scavengers. They're looking for anything that they can get, including dead bodies including little bits of floating anything, right? Any kind of opportunistic little scavengers. These guys are going to be your crabs, your amphipods, your isopods. Your filter feeders, these are going to be your clams, your mussels. Anybody who's pumping in water, taking out the food, and then pumping back out the water. Remember, different than suspension feeding, that's the grabbing and the eating. This is I'm taking in water, filtering it out, and then secreting out the water. And then finally, you're going to have your carnivores, like your sea stars, your snails, your fishes, your crabs, your flatworms, your birds. Birds, again, are part of the intertidal zone. You'll see birds walking around the shore. You'll see birds, well, if they can, get into a clam or a, a mussel. Absolutely, they're not really good at it, but they can if they went left open or vulnerable. Um, so again, very diverse community, nice, healthy ecosystem. Right? If you just had mussels, who's eating the mussels? Right? The sea stars. Not a lot can actually pry open those mussels. You lose the sea stars and mussels, just kind of outcompete everybody. And with that, right? all right, I will leave you guys and I will see you um, 
for our next lecture on the subtitle zone. Have a wonderful day.